You're live. Well, good day, good afternoon, good evening, good morning for some. Bienvenidos. I'm Sandy Yanone, you know, your host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. We are careening through September and today on our program is our wild card live open mic. And what, uh, what a deck of cards we have for all of you today uh, reading in the open mic. 12 poets, six minutes a piece. You'll be hearing poets from um, the UK, Scotland, uh, Ireland, Australia, uh, and parts of the United States. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a wonderful, wonderful wild card we've assembled for you today. I'm always thrilled that you choose to come to our Sunday, for some people Monday, uh, gatherings. We've been doing this weekly since March of 2020. And I continue to marvel at the poetry that is assembled and archived on our Cultivating Voices Live Poetry site on Facebook, where I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us live watching there at this moment. Uh, just a, a short reminder that, you know, we are, uh, we come together because you humbly signed up to a Facebook group called Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And over time, that has ballooned into 29, over 2,900 people now um, on the site. Uh, I appreciate everyone who's been posting about world poetry, um, connections, the poetry's connections to uh, world events, um, as well as new books and readings and you know, up, up, uh, upcoming things that we can connect with around poetry. Uh, it is every single week, there is such uh, an abundance and we could not do it without all of your participation. So again, my extreme gratitude for your continued interest, connection, uh, and there you have it. Keep, keep, keep it going, my friends, keep it going uh, as we get into at least here, the, the, as we approach fall, um, I will be probably going to many, many more poetry readings. So all the more uh, reason to keep posting things um, uh, so that we can all benefit and attend and support each other. Well, everyone, we have, as I mentioned, 12 fantastic readers, um, many of them, if not every single one of them, uh, has read with us before, they all have. And um, so it is such a delight to have this, this kaleidoscope of readers today. I will just be introducing them without bios because they just signed up uh, right before they came on. And you'll be hearing, um, about six minutes a piece from each person. If we can, we will go to a waiting list of poets. So if you are interested in perhaps reading a poem as we get to the end of the reading, feel free to put your full name um, in the list and just write open mic and Kim Ports Parsons, the delightful Kim Ports Parsons will be assembling those who might be joining us. Um, after our 12 features for today. Well, first up, joining us from Sussex, I'm so glad 
that uh, Prativa Cal is able to be with us today and following her will be Martina McGowan. Take it away, Prativa, and welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Yes, lovely to be here. Okay, I'm going to start off with a poem from, um, it's still forthcoming, my award-winning debut pamphlet, A Triptych of Birds and a Few Loose Feathers, published by Hedgehog Poetry Press. And this is inspired by um, my Irish heritage. It's called Wild Lass of Kells. She shuffles on the curb outside O'Shaughnessy's, corner of Kelly and Dunleven Road. Her eyes, the colour of Our Lady's veil, scorched bluer by her copper curls. On the lookout for the da, her task of a Friday night to wheedle the wages off of him before he sets out on the lash. Glad of a break from the chores, socks like a flock of crows forever jostling. Hand me down frocks in need of hems, pants snagged on barbed wire, nails atop of farmers' walls and fences. Herself, the firstborn of a baker's dozen, endless mopping up of spats, snail snots, scabby porridge pots. Licks of laughter, yellow light, sidle out the gaping door into the night, let out by colchies on their shuffle to the bar. Egypts with purple slurs for eyes, glances tossed her way, collection plate clink of small change at Sunday mass. The odd time, a flash of lust, the most time shame. A rare smile to build her up. Sure, aren't you a dote now, Delia? Looking out for your mammy. God bless yourself. Eyes cast down, pious daughter of the virgin. Lord love the child in her wilting dress. Miraculous blue medal clipped to the chest of her tatty cardigan. An occasion of sin, to be sure, Slovenes might take advantage of. Till she glances up, that glare, brazen as hell's fires, from the child of Mari of the scry eye, seventh daughter of a seventh son, flame hex of a wild blood tinker, Skipping off home to a last scald of the pot, wedge of soda farl thick with dripping. Her pocket is a clatter of coins, only the lighter by a bleary eyed pint. Thank you. The second one. Um, it was also first inspired by something from my childhood, a fair that we visited when my mother and I went back to visit the cousins, uh, it, also in Kells actually, but then it also morphed into something later on in my life. Narvan Fair. The cage dangles upside down on the tip of a tentacle flung like a baby's arm to its steepest sprawl. It idles in the breeze, quivers, my knuckles white, tight with clutching the metal bar. A singe of sugar rises from the candy floss stand and axle grease. Woolworth's cheap scent shouts laughter, hurdy-gurdy grizzle of the fair. I breathe like sipping water in a drought, barely enough to keep me conscious, lest falling into a belly-bloating wail, I loose my grip. How might it be to slip, soar, a swift inscribing secrets, or the blood clot that might have been you slipping out from between my legs to slump, limbs akimbo, a crooked star glinting in the churned up mud, 
essence seeping through jellyfish skin. My fingers tire, begin to fail, open, but the engine judders, runs back to life. Cogs once smooth stutter me back to the start. I clamber out, stagger through quicksand crowds, my face a clown's mask. And though my lips curve upwards, as if all this has been nothing more than a lark, my heart weeps clotted tears. Thank you. Sandy, I don't know if there's time for another short one or if that's my six minutes. Let's do a little short one. Why not? I never wanted uh, to turn down a poem, as okay. everybody knows. <laughs> so this one is called Forest Eulogy. It's in, in memory of my mother. I choose a druid oak to oversee your journey. Rest my back into its graveled spine. Sense its heartbeat syncopate with mine. A winter past, we savoured wine, sparkled to rubies by adder tongue flickers in the grate, crackling bark, guzzling. The relics, bone chips of log and ash, silky as the apple blossom talc you loved. Next day, you watched me fork the logs, dregs beneath your favourite David Austin. Your last choice, patience. You rest now beside the grate in a copper urn. Dawn sweeps away the night as I gather ash and chips in a shovel arthritic with rust. Cradle your pot, pad a gretel trail of golden dapple to your guardian tree. Sprinkle ash about its knuckly roots, lift my head to the echo in a blackbird's eulogy of your song. Thank you so much, Pratipa Castle. And uh, again, the, the upcoming pamphlet is a triptych of birds and uh, the sonics of the poetry uh, just never cease to amaze me. Thank you for joining us. Well, next is Martina McGowan joining us. And um, Martina's latest is I Am The Rage. And you've heard, of course, Martina read here a number of times as well. Welcome and thank you. And um, following Martina will be Bill Nevins. Thank you, Sandy. I'm gonna read two poems, um, so it'll be a little bit short. We watch as I've attained Ellie, not lost, because someone feels they have the right. Massage language, making it palatable, easy on the ear, on the tongue, easy to swallow but timeless and invisible manacles make bind us in complexities that will not allow us to protect and serve everyone. Reclassifying and codifying our discourse on the merit of race covered by a threadbare cloak of inequity, forsaking inquiry for greed and vanity. Is it preordained some lives are important while others are merely fodder for bullets? for senseless wars or for exploitation. Lives lost, not carelessly misplaced or dropped like lint dislodged from the back pocket of your favorite jeans on wash day. Life's, life stolen from another human being, original sin, never far from us, our hearts the first weapons of destruction. Burdened with apathetic judgments and minimal wage evaluations, stamped with early sell-by dates at birth on abominated lives, especially for those who do not look like, or talk like, or act like, or smell like us, or for no other reason than those lives simply do not matter to us. The second is, um, 
This is a work in progress it's called A Prettier Song After Etheridge Knight. You ask for prettier songs, brighter rhymes, fair and lighter melodies. My impoverished heart cannot comply for the truth is all I have on offer. Promises of brighter days still unfulfilled, temporary secondhand happiness, islands of joy and contentment lost in oceans of doubt and disillusionment. I too dream of breezes caressing my face, comforting waves as I walk the white sands, wallowing in open fields of wildflowers, toes dipping in cool creeks, basking in the moonlight beneath the stars. I await the opening of the madhouse doors once again, co-signing my dilatory freedom, hoping to release the sorrow, the constant heartache, let them float away lighter than air. One day, I shall sing of peace and love and hope and light for you. One day I shall write of beauty, but not now. For now, I am still a canary in a coal mine, taking a double dose of air so you may breathe. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Martina, again, the latest um, is I am the I am the rage. And I always I just always appreciate uh, the truth to power that you bring to your work and bring to our readings. And I'm going to give a little shout out uh, for a reading that you have upcoming this week uh, with on one of my favorite programs, The Quintessential Listening with Michael Anthony who Ingram, who is gonna be reading later. And, and that'll, be Wednesday, that'll be on Wednesday, the 22nd. Michael, be sure to uh, <laughs> announce that again. Thank you. Thank you again, Martina. Appreciate uh, the work as always. Um, next, we have Bill Nevins, uh, who just read uh, yesterday, just so uh, eloquently and robustly the, uh, the work of Jack Hirschman and on the tribute from Indran uh, Amir Vinayagam. Uh, appreciated hearing you. And after Bill will be Catherine Crowley. Thanks, Bill. Great. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm-hmm, you can hear me. Okay, good, all right. Um, bad Gaelic here. La and Dryleen, Rende, how them hungry birds flew. Even St. Stephen might have had to admit life can be pointless and transient, as must it be for them treacherous wrens or those two patient island folk. Yet we should act as if existence has beautiful aspects, could be beautiful itself, like a robin's call or a quick, clean death, if it existed at all. Like, for instance, the cries of laughing gulls on bikini at all. Olympia. Uh, Olympia in uh, Spanish uh, tradition is a uh, healing ceremony. Uh, Burque is the common name for uh, the town I live in most of the time, Albuquerque. And uh, La Jura is an unpleasant and unkind name for the popo, the police, the peelers. Olympia, Burque days. Glen cleansing the memories of peeling chiles, stringing ristras, celebrating the iguana and Santana. I wend this road many years on, whistling a bacho gypsy over the hill, knowing that there may be no fond Spanish goodbye song. As Stephen Delis remarked in Ulysses, we walk through ourselves, but always meeting ourselves. And I remember those tears. Those laughs, I just miss the South. Billy just muted.
It's frozen. All right. Well, Bill, I don't know if you can hear me. We will um, we'll come back and try to get back to you uh, and see if you pick up your signal. Um, sorry to have that happen in the middle of the poem. So let's move to Catherine Crowley from Limerick, one of my one, one of my truly my favorite places on the planet. So many friends there and looking forward and glad, so glad to have you with us. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been ages, ages. Hi everyone. Um yeah, thank you. And thanks Kim for reminding me and for motivating me. So today I was at the first live poetry event and music and storytelling event that I had witnessed for a year and a half, two years, it feels like five years. And it was in a church, an old church in Listowel in County Kerry, um, about an hour from where I live. So here is a poem that I wrote after a different gig in a, another old church in Ennis in County Clare. And it's called Drunk in Ennis. And for the uh, blatant self-promotion, that's from my chapbook, The Pollen Pages, The Little Honeybee and the Font. Thomas, thank you, I see you there. Some people have bought a few copies of this and it feels great. So. Drunken Ennis, plastic costume jewelry morphs into glowing precious gems as sunlight streams in like treasure. In front of me, a woman is wrapped in a rusty brown coat, fluffy beige trim on hood. The wind picks up to swish against church buttresses. We remain snug. A sunbeam warms a cold brass plaque on stone. Stained glass diamond shapes glow. Seven lemon window panels framed by light. Every person seems transfixed by the plucking of strings and baroque instruments. The clock is ticking, but here double bass is our timekeeper. As silence vibrates, we are vulnerable. Bald scalps shine next to hairy crowns. Candy floss, soft gray here, reddish blonde there. I see a gorgeous wool shawl, all green tones, moss, mint, and soft lime. In one window panel, men swig from a clay urn. I am drunk and colored light. And the second one I have for you this evening was written during lockdown in the depths of winter, during a tough, a tough time. So like many of you, I put the, the darkness to, to the page. This is called Masquerading as Rocks. When all the world became still, like a dog sick with mange, scratching a zillion fleas, Houdini trained and unreachable, your teeth chattered in the sun. When nothing could warm you up, your hopes became crocodiles that clamped the flesh of your dreams in their jaws until they tumbled from pylons to plunge into the river and you, being way beyond shock, were the only one who could see them. Their eyes and ears faced the sky. They mirrored your own inertia, masquerading as rocks. While I was on the hill planting seeds, sunflowers among buttercups. You thought that nobody saw you and no one even cared. But then at sunset, the thrush sang and something in you stirred after eons of being locked in. The heat spread through your body like delicate climbing tendrils. And when the fire sun melted at the liquid edge of night, the crocs opened their mouths. Your dreams became fireflies. 
and you will peace. So keep inhaling the future and know that the flying sparks won't always perform acrobatics. We're fading just like stars, swaying in the breeze like flowers. You fell down. You're alive. I see you. Thank you. Slancha. <laughs> oh, uh, beautiful. Uh, so glad to have you join us this evening for you, Catherine, the newest project <clears throat> among many is the Pollen Pages, joining us from Limerick. Again, folks, look at the chat, just, you know, you're getting the gratitude here. Uh, and I'm sure you're getting the gratitude also live on Facebook for those of you watching us um, on Facebook live. So be sure to check out uh, comments there as well. And welcome to our members joining us from Facebook. From Facebook. Next, we have Rosaline Callahan, welcome. So good to have you with us this evening. Oh, lovely. It's an absolute oh. delight to be here. It's always, always absolutely marvelous. So it's thrilling. Thank you very, very much. Um, this evening, if I can share with you 13 haikus. Um, so I'll just, none of them are titled. So I'll just start. Two haikus for the month that's in it in the US. Seven syllables, American 11, Herald the Horseman. May their names stand blessed. What is the price of mercy? Only everything. And then I have six <clears throat> haikus with liberties, um, observations on disintegration, also known as the aging process. So here we go. Gravity's no friend, pulls my tits on downwards bent, nipples carpet burn. This getting old lark, mouth has dentures, vagina still has all her teeth. Ads Press to coerce a turkey neck solution. Christmas is coming. Age grows darker spots. There's a cure for that all right. Eat your creams, good girl. Vaginal dryness, WD-40 works, industrial strength. Do not bring flowers. Drape my casket in red hats with feathers bright black. And five haikus on Ireland. They built a turf hut, shelter from Atlantic squalls after eviction. 4,000 Queen's ships replete crossed the Irish Sea, Black 47. Short back and no sides, haute couture garlands her crown, feathers, plume, hot tar. Irish pig he spits, an armed boy in soldier's garb, hogs civilian streets. The crouched priest waves high, a bleeding white handkerchief, don't shoot. Please don't shoot. Thank you for listening. It's such an amazing thing what one can do with the haiku. Uh, I, I always just you know marvel at that, and particularly the linked haiku. Um, and thank you, particularly, you know, last week we didn't um our reading fell on the 12th. So we didn't, uh, we didn't really have a, 
20th anniversary 9-11 reading, um, but I, 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 I was in a conversation last night with some friends and um, still talking about uh, watching, watching um, documentaries and things of that nature um, because truly uh, had a worldwide imprint um, as, as most things in the world should. Uh, and don't often, but uh, I so I so appreciate you bringing that to the reading today. Thank you, Rosaline. And next we have quite O'Neill McCullough. I'm so happy to have you return as well. It's beautiful to have you with us. The following uh, quite will be Phil Lynch. What a beautiful abundance this evening from across the pond. Thank you, Sandy. So uh, I'm just going to read one poem uh, this evening. This poem is called Jack Kerouac's Orange, an origin myth. Your mind makes out the orange by seeing it, hearing it, touching it, smelling it, tasting it, and thinking about it depending on your mind to exist. By itself, it's a no thing. It's seen only of your mind. From Jack Kerouac's The Dharma Bums. Like Jack Kerouac's orange, I am awake for you, baby. Baby, taste this flesh. Smell me, smell the myth of limonene. This orange wants to be seen. See me, hear me. Touch me, make me become, make me a something, baby. Baby, don't you feel the want, want to feel how it is, how it is to be empty, empty and awake and a no thing, nothing except of your mind. Spilled out like a squeezed sea, sea squeezed from an orange, a sodden orange from a Spanish ship, shipwrecked and empty and a no thing. Nothing except for the mind of a poet. Thinking about it, it's really mental. Things only seen of your own mind. But Jack got it wrong, baby. I am not your orange. You may have me in your mind's eye, thinking about it and me and all that existential, baby. You may say you saw me. Saw me and only me and only of your mind but it was me who was looking, baby. And baby, I was looking at the apple. It was me who was awake, awake and looking at the apple. It was always me, baby, baby, it was always me who took the first bite. Thank you. This is truly a wild, wild open mic today, tonight. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, Jack Kerouac's Orange. Hmm. Yes. All right. Next, we have one of my Salmon brothers, uh, Phil Lynch. And following Phil will be Linda Olson Graham. Good evening, Phil. Good evening, Sandy and everyone. Really enjoying it so far. Now, I have uh, plucked a handful of um, fairly short pieces here at, uh, ran at fairly short notice. So let's see how it goes. Start with this very short one, which is called Kindling. Set a fire, strike a match. When it catches, fan the flames, let it burn, spread the ashes, gather twigs, start again. So I think starting again is what a lot of us are doing, um, getting back into live uh, events and so on. Um, but this is starting back in my childhood. And uh, this is one that's called Stepping Stones. Um, I suppose it's just a reflection on the, the boisterousness and carefreeness of uh, life in, in rural Ireland when I was a child. Uh, and um, yeah, with the much care for those who were uh, allowing us to be carefree, I suppose. Stepping stones. We hop on stepping stones to cross the river on the way home from school. And where the water narrows its furrow, we learn through bets, stairs and bravado to jump from bank to bank. 
We run free spirited as the rain through wild flowered fields, climbing gates, jumping stiles. We are high jumpers and pole vaulters, riders of bucking broncos, playing cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers, spies and spy catchers, goodies and baddies, all in one day. The only barrier to our stride is when it comes to sleep. Even then, our minds continue to chase adventure of all kinds. Snipers on the loose near the house, we dive to hide behind a giant clamp of turf. Something moves inside the shed, a head pops out and shouts, you're dead. When light creeps back to tap the glass, we crank up our boisterous engines and mingle with the whir and rattle of machines at work. The beast of barking dogs and all the other moving parts of life being lightly lived oblivious of the burden weighing on the ones who make it home. Um, I'm going to do uh, one from my collection in a changing light, uh, salmon production as Sandy mentioned. This is called Fear Flying. A lone bird flies diagonally northeastwards across the evening sky as the pink peppered afterglow of a hot sunset begins to fade and the northeast sky is darker than the other side. Not a breeze to disturb the full leafed trees. The bird is flying hard, wings flapping madly, threading the air for dear life, for fear of being left adrift in the fading light, cut loose in the dark. Um, thank you. and. Uh, I suppose this is a bit about fear flying as well. Um, it's uh, when I was a child as well. Um, we lived near a lake which was full of bog holes. Uh, if people understand what bog holes are, uh, very deep holes uh, full of water. <laughs> and my father uh, instilled a fear of water, of yeah, of water in us. Uh, we were allowed up to our maybe knees in the water, but no further because of the fear of drowning. So it took me a long time to get over that. It's called learning to swim. After a hot, dusty day in the hayfield, we would go for a dip in the lake. Never a swim. Full of bog holes, my father warned. Strong men had drowned there. Men with heroic deeds to their names could not be saved. Fear fully formed, stuck in the shallows for decades. It took a sizzling Greek island's holiday and the lure of the welcoming Aegean to spur me on. Back in Dublin, Determined to be brave, I misjudged a grab for the side and went under at the deep end, nearly drowning in my panic to survive. It was this mishap that gave me the final push and the courage to believe I could dive into the deep with nothing but the water for support and keep going. When I drift back to that bog hold lake, I wonder if I have ever fully let go. Um, finish with two short ones. Uh, so this one is called Whistler. Whistler spends his days sifting sand through his hands, sometimes by the sea, sometimes on the land. When I asked him why, he said it comforts him to know there is more sand than he has time. And finally, um, another one from In a Changing Light. This is a love poem, a love sonnet. The subject is love itself and encounters one might have with it along the way. And it's called Encounters. I might have met you once while on the road, but how was I to know you would be there? No map to guide, no picture to compare. So why would I have stopped or even slowed? And yet, if you had signaled me your code, I would have shyly shuffled, unaware that you and I could have so much to share. I'd still to learn what nature had bestowed. But later when we met, I knew you well, although I least expected you to be so blissful, yet so able to confound. Instead of catching me when first I fell, you put me in a boat that's still at sea, in search of shores which never may be found. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Phil Lynch. And just 
you know, your collection in a changing light was the very first salmon poetry book that I added to my collection. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, always glad to have the poems come off the page from there with the fond memory of buying that book before I would have a connection to, to salmon. Thank you so much for joining us and also reminding me of kind of my own struggles with learning to swim as well. I'm thinking about starting over. Well, next we go from, uh, we go to a place and uh, a poet uh, surrounded by water uh, uh, on Cape Cod, uh, our fabulous dear friend, Linda Olson Graham, and following Linda, will uh, will be, uh, where is my list? I'm sorry. Linda, go ahead and I'll get my act together. <laughs> All right, Sandy. Captain will be following Linda. Well, there you go. It's lovely to be with everyone. Um, my writing is under the name Earth, Ocean, Heavens, which is a name that came to me out in the open ocean. I had the blessing of sailing thousands of miles in my 20s and like a lightning bolt, um, that name came to me. I thought I'll put a link on the in the chat to the book. Um, I have a book on the homepage of two websites. One of my websites is my name, all one word, lowercase, lindaolsengraham.com. And uh, I thought it's appropriate to share something that I wrote the morning of September 12th, 2001. I saw the plane hit the World Trade Center building. I was doing home health care in Cape Cod. Um, on the morning of September 11th. I had a one month exhibit at a bank in on the elbow of Cape Cod. Cape Cod is sh shaped like that and I'm out here on the end. Um, so in Orleans, um, I had an exhibit with a whole wall of big sky photographs and piece of art with writing, half inch writing. And then one small piece of art that had four thoughts in it. And I saw the plane hit the World Trade Center building. I woke up the next morning inspired to create a new piece of art I extracted two lines that were part of a piece of art already in the exhibit and enlarged them in a 30 by 40 frame. So one of the lines is a question that I opened a poetry festival master class writing exercise when the gentleman said, write about something you have an interest in. And then he inserted you phrases that were like you bends in the writing. So I opened the exercise with this question. Has the time arrived when humanity is able to digest the remarkable reality of just how simple it could be to shift the earth's vibration. And then the other thought that I extracted from a small piece of art shared about the French philosopher Thierry de Chardin, who created the word noosphere, N-O-O-S-P-H-E-R-E, -E, to describe a layer of thought that hovers above nature and acts as a universal consciousness. It's what people think of as the one mind or the collective consciousness, Chardin actually felt that our thoughts go up to an energy field that surrounds the planet and that they're reflected back. So I came up with this philosophy that if enough people could quiet their thinking minds just for a few minutes daily, it would quiet that atmosphere around the planet. And incrementally, I believe it's a formula for world peace. World peace, calmer weather, um, end to terrorist attacks, and I've added insights into curing and eradicating the pandemic. Because when people meditate, you, I mean, I, I was taught to meditate on a mountaintop in Haiti when I was sailing in 76. And I, sometimes, I, I mean, if I have a question in my mind, I just go inside and listen and an insight will come. So I, I really believe that could happen to all of us collectively as a race of people. If enough people could quiet their minds, we would get insights into how to cure what needs curing right now. So the line that closes my website, Linda Olson Graham is, please hold the thought with me that peace on earth and calmer weather patterns can easily happen in a moment or two of silence in enough of the collective mind. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. Oh, sure. For always sharing, you know, those insights that are about uh, our necessity for caring for the earth, striving for peace 
and connecting with each other. And, um, and I loved hearing the voice of uh, a person I know is near and dear to you in your heart in the background today. <laughs> I'll have to pick him up in a minute. So he'll be sitting on my lap. He's actually been sleeping for about an hour and Absolutely. just woke up. So <laughs> my little buddy. <laughs> well, so this open mic just brings, you know, so many, so many things unexpected uh, to our consciousness through all of your consciousness. Uh, and next we go from the Cape all across the continental U.S. over to uh, San Francisco Bay, one of my favorite, another of my favorite places. And one of my dear sisters, Carolyn Tipton. Hello. Hi, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy and Don and Kim and hello, everybody. Um, I wanted to start with a poem from my newest book, um, from Salmon Poetry, again, Jesse Lenini, the poet of Poet Laval. I wrote this poem one April when I was in Vermont and being a native Californian, I was just astonished to see that the whole world seemed to be melting. In Vermont, it is melting season here, April, and suddenly the still landscape is loud with voices, not just those of the birds newly returned, but water voices. Everywhere the sun is melting ice and snow and rivulet streams, waterfalls are pouring, coursing, rushing down the mountainside. Listen, what was mute as cloud now sings the jocelyn songs of glass. It is a tale where white buffalo dissolves into a chant of rain. But what is this transformation, silent, solid, white into voice transparency, took over the whole countryside? What if the birches too should melt and begin ringing out like bells? The next poem I'd like to read is from Returnings, my most recent translation of poems by the amazing 20th century Spanish poet, Rafael Alberti. He wrote this book in exile from Franco. Um, he returned in his imagination to the people and places of his lost country. And sometimes he remembers so vividly that it comes alive again for him. Love returns to landscapes still alive. We believe love that those landscapes are asleep or dead along with us. Their true life locked away back in the days we spent in them. We believe the, the trees have lost their memory. The nights have thinned and given away whatever made them beautiful and timeless. But it takes just the slightest trembling of a leaf the sudden breathing of a burnt out star to find ourselves the same ones whose delight filled the places that held fast our own embrace. And so today, love, you awaken at my side among wild currants and hidden strawberries protected by the staunch heart of the forest. Here is the wet kiss of the dew, the tender blades of grass that cool your bed, the enchanted sylphs who decorate your hair, and the high mysterious squirrels whose play rains down the green small change of branches on your sleep. Leaf may you always be happy and never know autumn. Leaf whose slight trembling carried back to me the fragrance of those blind and luminous days. And you lost star who opened up for me an intimate window onto my youngest nights. May you never stop shining on all the beds we slept in until dawn and that library lit by the moon and those books falling quietly open and the mountains outside awake and singing to us. So 
this another take on love, um, a new poem, thinking of the Greek myth of Daphne. Daphne, at the moment when that girl became a tree, mythic Daphne fleeing the gods' sexual intentions, running, praying to escape Apollo's hands, she must have been surprised to see her fingers turn to leaves. She must have felt relief to have avoided rape. Then maybe a different relief to begin to feel rooted, solid, her heart shedding emotion, turning to smooth wood, not subject now to fear or anger, jealousy, resentment, or desire, no longer shaken by love, no longer caring either about the God's attention or the inattention of the boys she yearned for in the town. Beginning to feel just what a laurel feels, the sun, the wind. But I wonder if she ever felt an atavistic trace of emotion. If when the wind tossed her upper branches or the birds fluttered in her leaves, she had a sensation akin to missing the heart's ferment. But then the agitation passed like the passing of a cloud and she was left serene. Uh, for my last poem, uh, this is a current poem featuring bells like the first poem. Uh, here I'm thinking of Pete Seeger's song, The Bells of Rimney. It's a song about the mining disasters of Wales and in it, the bells sing colors and sing emotions. Hearing the bells of Rimney. In the bells of Rimney, the bells of each town toll a different color and some peel different emotions. Merthyr's bells are brown and Rimney's are sad. Some ask questions, who killed the miners? The song of the mining disasters of Wales is stuck in my mind because of the bells. What if we really did have bells that could articulate communal feelings or even initiate them? It's the black bells of grief you've all been hearing, the red bells of alarm. But what if the bells sensed or could help bring about a change? Are we seen a new scene? Could they lift us from our gray habit of sadness if they suddenly began to ring out green? Thank you. Um, thank you for those poems today that truly sang, you know, like, like bells ringing. Oh, the, and uh, of course, a reminder of your deep affinity and affection for Raphael Aberti, whom you brought to us for the first time when you read on our translations reading. Thank you. So good to have you with us today. Beautiful. Well, our final three readers, featured readers in the wild card open mic today um, are, we're gonna start with uh, Michael Ingram. Uh, Michael, Michael Anthony Ingram, uh, you know Michael from that, reading series that I like to encourage folks to listen to because it is about quintessential listening uh, on Blog Talk Radio. Please welcome Michael Anthony Ingram. All right, thank you, Sandy. As always, I'd like to say first that Sandy is correct on Wednesday night Martina McGowan will be with me on Quintessential Listening. It, she will be my 182nd guest. So that makes me very, very happy. I'm glad that she'll be with me Wednesday night. I'd like to recite one piece. The title is When I Dream of Paris. I had this lifelong fascination with the city of light. And I finally had an opportunity to visit in 2020, but my plans were scuttled due to the pandemic. 
so I didn't get a chance to go. But when I dream of Paris, that's where I'd like to be. But this is when I dream of Paris. When I dream of Paris, the skies fill with patriot desires, desires that melt and flow like dolly landscapes across the horizon. I want brutally on the Jones and Lisa's job and only drink coffee at a small cafe near the river's edge. I must drink quickly because it's patient desires don't linger long when you live in small town, North Carolina, a place where Dolly is better known as the name of the melancholy schoolgirl who lived fast yet died young. But when I dream of Paris, my nostrils feel with transporting fragrances, smells that lure and enchant like the city of light itself. And the other beauty of La Sacre Terre, Montmartre and Montparnasse, is that delicately the flowers that grow in Leisure and Luxembourg. I must exhale slowly because transporting fragrances don't linger long when they're bundled up in sacks of dirty clothes that your mother washes for neighboring families. And it's your turn, your turn, your turn, your turn to sort for you. But when I dream of Paris, the night is here, the music of Josephine Baker, I ease up as her siren song calls the twilight, DJ Desamour. I must listen intently. Because the voice I fear is not that of La Femme Josephine, nor is the gentle will of Mrs. Mary Alice Grayson, an old woman that my family visits the Greater Peace nursing home. In her room, in her private world, she sways and shimmies all day to the rhythm of the music she alone hears. She smiles and curtsies to the men she knew when she knew no loss or pain. Breathless from antiquated memories, she clutches her tattered purse and fingers the red seat rose that is pinned to her dress. But when I dream of Paris, I stop to dream and I awake to more realistic life. Thank you. Now that is quintessential listening for my ears. That poem, When I Dream of Paris. You'll get there, my friend, you'll get there. Right. You, will get there. you will get there, no doubt, no doubt. And don't forget to join on Wednesday. Uh, and listen to the previous episodes, all 182. Congratulations uh, on that. Uh, Kate Wegerson here, one of like, like great interviews there. I love that episode so much. Thank you so much, Michael Anthony Ingram. And next, we go to our next to last featured reader for today in the wild card open mic, Larry Kirshner, my, my, my neighbor. <laughs> Welcome, Larry. Thanks, Andy. Uh, last week, um, Grace Cavalieri read a poem, The Picnic by the Ocean, in which she mentioned uh, octopuses with three hearts. And it intrigued me, and this came about. Hearts. The giant Pacific octopus has three hearts, nine brains, and royal blue blood. Common earthworms have five hearts. Slime-producing hagfish have four hearts. Cockroaches manage with 13 hearts, while men with no hearts to offer you, threaten to set nuclear fire to the earth and the sky. The light will not be cold. The final sigh will be articulate. So further in the week, I, I heard an interview that Grace did with Sandy. And Sandy mentioned uh, in discussing her book, uh, a line, um, the boat broke in two like a stereotypical heart, which connected up with grace in, in that way. And I've, uh, this poem I've, I've written for Sandy and I've been working on it for a while and I'm still not convinced it's totally done, but we'll see. Uh, four days into the journey with an epigraph, one week later, those face down in the icy fields wait for another kind of rescue. Sandra Yanone votes for women. 
In the early hours of April 15, 1912, 370 miles south of Newfoundland, air temperature 39 degrees Fahrenheit, gray cold sea 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Captain Smith said, full speed ahead on the clear, moonless, star studded night, knowing there was ice in the area, but sure that the three so sailors on lookout in the dark would spot any floating danger in time. Having previously worked together on cargo ships, traveling between China and Europe, Ah Lam, Fang Lang, Lin Lam, Chang Fu, Chang Chip, he, Ling He, Li Bing, Li Ling. Eight Chinese friends boarded together, listed on one ticket, listed on the same ticket at Southampton on the British steamship's first transatlantic voyage, crammed into the dark, third-class windowless cabin in the bow of the unsinkable ship. The broken ship headed 12,600 feet straight down, 10 minutes to reach a dark resting place with its crushing 3,000 atmospheres of pressure. Those passengers left in the sinking ship were surely dead after the first cold 500 feet. Len Lam and Li Ling were greeted by Yu Kuang, Chinese god of the oceans, riding on two dragons. But five of the others made it to lifeboats. After apparently not understanding instructions to stay in their rooms until told to come out. In a scene later portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio, 17 year old Feng Lang was found by flashlight hanging on a floating wooden door on, on the rescuer's last sweep in the frigid waters with bodies face down, bobbing as ice cubes. Marking the end of open borders, the US Page Act of 1875 barred immigration of Chinese women. All but Li Bing were single in this group of the eight sailors who were on their way to Cuba to work. While most of the survivors were feted on their eventual arrival in New York City, the seven Chinese survivors were met with strong anti-Chinese sentiment, falsely accused of, of saving their own lives ahead of women and children by hiding in the lifeboats. Unlike others, they received no medical attention. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle called the Chinese survivors creatures who had sprung into the lifeboats at the first sign of danger and concealed themselves beneath the seats. False information spread by the Titanic owner, J. Bruce Ismay, who ended up safe in a lifeboat with four of the Chinese men. Within 24 hours of arrival, after being held overnight in custody at the inspection station at Ellis Island, the Asian mariners were expelled from the country under the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred all Chinese people from immigrating to the US. In and out of the harbor, past the icon of freedom and of the United States, the lady a supposed symbol of welcome to all immigrants arriving by sea. A century later, during the recent pandemic, hateful anti-Asian attitudes have again been visible in the land of the free. The last president spoke belittlingly of Kung flu. Fox News commentators say diversity is not a strength. Not so long ago, public health officials in the US described Chinese people as disease-ridden and dirty. Americans living in willful ignorance, hubris of racial superiority, and fear of other purposely induced 
by those who control the media appear to have no clue how to walk in a different direction. And for the final poem, uh, this is called The Last Loud Sound, the epigraph, uh, Rest is Silence, William Shakespeare. When I read Francesca Bell's poem, What Small Sound, in a recent issue of Rattle, I had just spent two weeks re-realizing my loss, waiting for my hearing aids to be returned after repair by the VA audiologist. She noticed her hearing leaving when she was 24. She spoke of deafness expanding imperceptibly, as had mine over the last 50 years, since the day when I was a 21-year-old boy soldier and the grenade went off close by in the midst of the ambush. And this is uh, my most recent book too. It's called Selected Bones, 1970-2020, with a great forward by Fergus Hogan, friend of Cultivating Voice. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. If, if, um, if the only, the only thing that that one of my poems does is inspire someone else to write. That's that's the best that's the best thing that one of my poems could do. So thank you. And of course, I I too have read about those passengers on the Titanic. Um, I I didn't write about them, but I'm glad that you have and. Um, someday I hope to do an anthology of Titanic poems. So I'll be knocking on your door for that poem. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. And congratulations on your new book, which I'm hoping you'll come and read in a future new book showcase when I start booking for next year. Well, we are, um, we now have our final reader for the wild card open mic, and I think we're going to have some time for a few last poems after. I'm so, so thrilled to uh, hear the poetry this morning for him, but um, evening and afternoon for most of us. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us, Michael Mick Meza. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, this one's called This Land, where the mountain meets the seas, where you'll find the coral key. From the tropics to the snows, where the mountain ranges grow. With the dunes in the desert shapes a landscape of no man's land, this land is you and me. Where the red soul is a rock sitting in the centre, shaped by the weather where the dreaming will be. Where the rivers run dry and the fires burn rampantly, this land regenerates in you and me. Our island is a home to a fauna that carries its own from the tropics to the stunted gum trees. On arid soil and muddy paddocks and meadows, the land we share where they are free. From north to south and east to west, a varied landscape. How in our bequest, we will maintain its soul, culture and liberty. This land is our democracy. I love this land that has adopted me, its wide diaspora and its hospitality. Will we bear the future progeny for this land that has embraced me. This land that welcomed me, breaks your heart learning about its history. Can we reconcile with the past, reshape a new destiny? This land has a future I see. And from the Gulf of Carpentaria to the roaring 40s, the eight coals to the Great Barrier Reef, the weather that's so unique, protected by the ocean, it's wonderful beast. This land has many stories and festivities. And I'll sing a song and dance to this joyful corroboree, to this never, never, I call home surrounded by the sea and with, with feet planted in red soil that nourishes me, this land is sacred to me.
And this one is called the parade. All right. I caught up with an old flame, Margarita on Father's Day. I knew her as Rita. We had sex on the beach the old fashioned way. At dusk, we watched the Kalua sunset shading the starry night. Ended up sleeping on her butterfly nipple, and she nudged me up in the morning with a Sicilian kiss. Picked myself up with an eggnog for breakfast, and we caught the train to Manhattan. I was surprised to see some Pat St. Patrick's Day parade, and there was a green horn. Hornet and Martini in a hot mist, tethering, tethering the Moscow mule, the scheming white Russian they captured. Next came the French connection, grooving and doing the spritz with my sidecar overtook them in this cosmopolitan city. Vespa rode through, doing a mono hops and slid on an oil slick. Everyone cheered and laughed, and so did I. Respectable Bill Collins on the loudspeaker said that Alice in Wonderland had disappeared down the drain. The fans booed and hissed and calmed down when three wise men walked past. Then a cannonball was fired and there was an extremely loud noise followed by an Irish car bomb. Ruckless and frantic, I escaped with Rita from the fireball that spoiled the show. After running away, we ran into Bloody Mary. Trying to give her first aid, she'd jump up and kiss me. Oh, trying to give her... Having seen that Rita had that... No, trying to give her the first date, she don't but kiss me. Haven't seen that that Rita had a nervous breakdown. Every dog has its day, and I'm having one too. Relaxed, I pushed her away and told told her she was dark and stormy person. Meanwhile, Rita was pointing to El Diablo post us saying the Lord's Prayer. I pulled her away. We ran, we ran to the metro, headed back to the B and B. And you better believe me, she was the best Latin lover. Now I'm too scared to holiday there. And the acrostic line reads, I wake up with a hangover on Father's Day. And Father's Day was a couple of weeks ago. Have I got time for one more or that's it? One more? All right. True blue fighting spirit. This is a bit of history. And behind me, you can watch the sunrise. Oh, well, five minutes ago it did. There's a frack... <laughs> There's a fracture in a line, a breakout the troopers don't need. There's an Indian file campsite out towards Eureka League. There's a captain's call to arms where the first arts building stands assembled to assault the stockade and cut the flag from where it hangs. There's cumulus clouds up high. The licence fees are steep and there's unlicensed miners frustrated by colonial greed. There's a charge to the barricade, an uprising fueled by anger. There's the horsemen of apocalypse spreading malcontent and danger. The shots fired to and fro and the ground's irrigated red. There's Fitzgerald drawing sword, cutting down a hand-stitched flag. There's a rebellion down the hill and troopers dispensing law. That's for you, Sandy, call me a trooper. Troopers dispensing law and how many did Dr. Wills heal, heal for those fighting for a fair go? Now there's a repair in the line where the fine arts building stands. There's a large glass casing where the eight corner stars hang. There's a lot of years gone by, different stories being told, and there's books and souvenirs about Ballarat and its gold. And there's a Southern Cross swaying for grains on construction site. And there's a true blue fight and spirit left in our culture to keep up a fair fight. And thank you very much. Thank you. You add the wild to the wild card today. You add the wild to the wild card. And thanks for getting up like at the crack of dawn and we get to see the sunset with you. Amazing. Sunrise. <laughs> sunrise, excuse me, the sunrise. <laughs> Thank, right. Thank you. Hey folks, we're gonna go back hopefully if, um, if he is willing and able to join us for his second poem when Bill Nevins got cut off from the, uh, from the feed. And so if Bill can join us and try to give us that, that uh, if we can hear his second poem, and then we'll go to two folks on the wait list for one poem each, and we'll call it a day, night, evening, morning.
Bill, are you with us? I'll try. Hey. Yeah, I hear you. If you can hear me, I'll give it a shot. Okay. Um, here we go. Can you hear me? I, I can't hear you. Okay. Here we go. I, you know what? I'm going to turn off my video. Maybe that'll work. There we go. No video. Um, Kabul sunset just over the horizon. As proud robed Mujahideen give wary thanks in bearded faces to Allah in the ruins of forward operating bases, daubed in sad skull graffiti boasts of long departed Yanks, Red Army ghosts haunt rusted tanks. American Fighters roared over afterburners blazing in the middle of a sangre de Cristo day when most of us were cutting firewood, watching deer, or just lazing. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, our aerial warriors at play. Some say it's just a training exercise and we should be glad. Afghanistan, you see, has mountains like these, and we're enjoying our safety in the land of free, home of the high-flying brave. Taliban ain't got no air force, that's for damn sure, Jack. Raise your eyes to the contrails and whisper the pledge, and watch your back, buddy. Fucking hell. Did you serve? Maybe it's just me. But low-flying combat planes crashing the air above just don't make me feel comfy, you see. Too many kids have died, napalm white phosphorus and bombs, B-52s to raptor drones, the glorious sonic blast of death, caskets draped in flags or charred bodies tossed in a ditch. Does it matter which? But hey, mate, enjoy your jingo pride. Shed some Patriot tears, savor the boom, stick some cotton in both ears, crack a few beers, put a steak on the grill, and smell the burn. Well, that was a light one, so I'll read a, read a serious one here. Uh, this one is called Siberia. It's spelled C-Y-B-E-R-I-A. Siberia. On joining the State Poetry Society for Yevdoshenko. Meetings every Tuesday, cold old pizza and schlitz while they defined rhyme schemes. I got the shits. They cut my wrist, sucked real hard, and then they sent me a membership card. One of us now, lad, blood in and blood out. We love you of that, there's no doubt. Dreamt the versifiers Soviet caught me. Made me pay dues to spit out poetry. Illegal, Mescal, and Gorbachev's tattoo. I slept so well, I woke up an ice blue haiku. Can I do one more? <laughs> sure, why not? We've got, we're, yeah, we're, we're going to be good, I think, on time. Go right ahead. I'll do one more. I will do one that uh, Sandy and, and some of you guys have already heard. I did it yesterday. Um, it's Hirschman, a poem in three parts. Caro Jack in the morning of this new world. Don't mourn. Organize. Jack Hirschman in the city lights stacked, declaiming his arcanes where Sharon Dubiago first introduced us years ago. Jack on the bus, riding to a reading, his red scarf wrapped, smiling with his satchel of poems under his arm. Jack singing in Russian to the good woman of Specs who gave him a chocolate cake and a hug for his birthday. Jack at the Buddhist school, teaching the rich Naropa kids the manifesto, the greatest poem of all as Alan's double rainbow graced that boulder sky. Jack came home after an evening of his people's poetry work to Aggie and us two visitors from afar, 
filling our glasses with vodka or wine, then reciting, sailing to Byzantium in its entirety from memory to show us what pure poetry can mean, to show us what the mind can be, to show the red way as revolution rose from the streets of North Beach, as Jack laughed and loved and danced and sang, as our lives rolled on, as the world began, as Jack lives with us each brave new dawn. Part two, Jack in the Long March. Most poets are like meteors slicing our sky. They flash as beautiful and then are gone in the blink of an eye into the endless dark. Most poets, even fine and lovely ones, will be forgotten in the long run. Most poets are not poets like Jack. History will not forget Jack Hirschman. Viva Jack Hirschman! Blazing bright, siempre Jack Hirschman presente. Part three. Jack, manifest. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Workers of all countries, unite. Mira. Compo Jack. Pensaremos. Thank you. Bravo, Bill Nevins. Bravo. Thank you. I I hope also that um, in that way that I hope that um, that there's a Titanic anthology that can that can that can hold Larry's poem. That I hope that there's a I hope there's a tribute anthology. To Jack Hirschman, and that then that your poem will be the opening poem. Now I've gotten to hear it twice. Thank you. Thanks for bringing it to us here today on Cultivating Voices. Jack Hirschman was um, the po former poet laureate, one of the former poet laureates of San Francisco, among many, many other things, for those of you who may not be familiar look up um, his work and um, the work he did in his life. All right, thank you, Bill. We're gonna go to, we're gonna get the waiting list in and we'll probably come in just a little over 90 minutes, which is what I was kind of hoping for. So we'll hear two more poems, one each from um, Max Vandersteen joining us um, uh, from Alberta, and Kate Wegerson will close us out for today. Hi, Max. Hi, Sandy. Thanks for this opportunity. I appreciate following this uh, profound group of poets that preceded me. So I wrote this poem a very short while ago, kind of continuing my focus on petrol poetics. Many of you know I'm a retired pipe fitter. And um, Following up on that theme, as I said, this poem's called Conscripted. I am a conscript of the working class, reckoned to be undermined and only a collaborating operative, cannon fodder in a gory story of war bombarded by sly weaponry and brutish, perfidious maneuvers of a narrow oilfield oligarchy. Considered by the general public as an environmental enemy working to produce dirty energy and to petrochemical generals, just an expendable overpaid pawn, no escape from stress or PTSD, this no man's land is the reality. I am a soldier serving brotherhood, camouflaged in my greasy coveralls, coerced by conditions and submission to face combat in a hostile oil patch battleground of bitumen emplacements. Shell shocked amid bunkers, tanks and catwalks looming like gangplanks leading to abyss. I seek and peek from bulwarks and foxholes at legions of toxins hidden in mist, cloaked and neglected by foreign agents deployed to develop crude resources. 
shielded only by an allegiance sworn, our vows of words become strong as the sword, inspiring spirits of fire boldly born. I am a warrior working each day, so far away from comforts or pleasures, sweet smells of females, flowers, or fresh air, sweating to ease other people's pressures. I am a servant to the enterprise, immersed in septic workplace settlements, mobilized in booms of the black gold rush, toiling to unearth another's treasures. I am a crusader for equality, engaged in conflict for echo justice with brigades of bonded benevolent men countering through acts of integrity, imbalance between workplace and earth's face amidst interactional disparity. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Max. I like that um, you have, I, I, I think there is something powerful to um, this idea of petrol poetics, uh, the, the, the cousin to eco poetics. I think you're definitely onto something. Keep going. Thanks. All right, our last reader for, for me this afternoon, our good friend, Kate Wegerson. I'm so glad to see you. I think you had a couple weeks off and that's very rare for you. So I'm glad to have you with us today and get to hear you read. Thank you so much, Sandy. I do have a very short poem, one minute. And it was my daughter's favorite as I studied for weeks in seclusion to join the quintessential listening. So I do have that short poem, but I'd like to preempt very briefly that nature and the way we think sometimes. At first, my first response was, oh, the Italians are so lovely. Look at them out on their balconies singing to each other. I was not aware that then we would have a world of first responders overwhelmed. And that in my little private Idaho, oh, Idaho is such a mess, I'm in Colorado, now our county for three weeks is at 100% full in the hospitals. You couldn't get a baby to be taken care of an earache or an appendicitis or a car accident. It's full. And the disregard that has been shown now in the USA, hundreds of thousands of people in football fields yelling with excitement and letting their spit out and I'm saying, I'm praying, I'm praying that we will turn this around. It's not a 12 month, it's over, let's go do what we want. I stay in seclusion at my home, writing poetry and thankful for cultivating voices, sharing the stories of the poets of the world, teaching me that it wasn't just a lovely song on a balcony. It was the first response to a hundred year plague. This is my little poem, my daughter's favorite. Fox and the soul of a woman. Lone fox in my yard stopped in its tracks, listening. Thoughts spelled out in code, no interruption. Night fox and a woman's soul, each late for the dawn, watching the clouds sail, listening in silence. Snowflakes fall gently, dark sky stars ascend, heaven sent. How will I know you, long memory now? Fox listened to my thoughts, stopped again in its tracks keen listening. I spelled out my code. There was no interruption. A lovely song rang out under night's fading moonlight. A fox and the soul of a woman await dawn. Long lasting 
ancient echoes resound, weaving change for the best outcome in the round. Blessings to all. And now I start crying. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, the strength, the strength of your voice continues to grow over time. I've witnessed it. I'm very grateful to have it be shared with all of us. And uh, I too share your horror at, um, I was, before I came on today, I was reading about hos the hospital, um, the hospitals here in, 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 in my county and we're at the highest levels we've ever been. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, start, we started Cultivating Voices Live Poetry in response to things being shut down in the pandemic. And frankly, from where I'm sitting here, we're back to day one. We're, 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 we're right back to where we were in March, 2020. Um, yes, there's vaccinations and, and all of that, but when, when when the hospital rates and the death rates in my area are the highest they've ever been. Um, we continue to need to be mindful and we continue to be in the space that we were when we gathered though for those very first readings. I'm grateful for everybody. And today's reading as a live open mic, a wild card live open mic really harkens back to um, the formats that we had in those first um, in those first months, and it was quite remarkable the intersections of all of your voices today in um, in what you consciously and unconsciously were connecting with each other. Uh, not we didn't have a theme, and yet uh, I felt there were many many themes that were in concert with each other want to thank everyone for being here today on the wild card live open mic. I will remind you whom we heard from today. We began at the top of the hour with Pratiba Castle, Martina McGowan, Bill Nevins, Catherine Crowley, Rosaline Callahan, Quaito Neil McCullough, Phil Lynch, Linda Olson Graham, Carolyn Tipton, Michael Anthony Ingram, Larry Kirshner, Michael Mick Meza, and we got into our wait list right under the wire, Max Vandersteen, and closed out with the, oh, I want to have a, the stellar Kate Legerson. Thank you everyone for taking the time to bring your voices and words to our humble stage today. We're going to be joining you next week, of course, on Sunday with our last new books showcase of the month of September. And joining us will be Carolyn Wright, Marge Sizer, Jim Sealar, and Claire Kelly joining us from Canada. All will be well on Sunday when we come together. It is always for me the most calming and productive hour, hour and a half that I spend. Um, it's my respite from the things that all of you have spoken of. Um, and yet we speak of those things together. Thank you one and all. I wish everyone a um, 
as peaceful a week as you can muster here, uh, here where you are. And a reminder, as I always say to you, that you know, truly, you know, our humanity depends on our deep listening. And I'm very, very grateful for everyone who comes together on Sundays to practice, or Mondays, uh, to practice deep listening through the art of poetry here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. You, there are many, many readings coming up this week. I encourage you to check them out on our Facebook page and beyond and the other groups that you're in. It's just so many spectacular things um, available to us to support us um, through these times. A very, very good week to all. Take very good care. Take very good care of your beloveds. And of course, keep writing. Have a good week. <laughs>